Listen, when you pick your own nickname, it's kind of lame, isn't it? Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime. If you are new here, hello. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup while I do it. If that sounds good to you, then you should just go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell notification and then that way you get a reminder every time I upload a new video. I'm very excited to say that today's episode is sponsored by Casetify. So Casetify was kind enough to send me some cell phone cases to try out and they even personalized it just for me, YouTube's premier crew trime goblin. <laughs> Casetify has about a million different options and designs and varying degrees of protection depending on what you're looking for. Now I'm a total spaz so I need like military grade drop protection which is a thing by the way this is the ultra impact case oh, you're seeing all my notifications <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, go away. This is one of the cases. This is an ultra impact case. It has these extra corner bumpers. This is rated for like a nine foot drop. The regular impact case has a slimmer profile. It doesn't have those bumpers, but it definitely has that serious strength, even if you're not into all that extra rubber. Your flexion came in really big on that thing. Isn't it gross? Yeah, sorry. Oof. Oh. So I've had this ultra impact case on my phone for a few weeks now and I fully dropped it down the stairs. It was an accident. I wasn't trying to like test it, but much protect. So these cases are antimicrobial and made from recycled materials, which you know I love. And you can save 15% on your order at casetify.com slash goblin. We love it. We love it. So if you have been looking for the perfect phone case for yourself or for a friend, Look no further. Thank you again to Casetify, and now let's get back to this terrible story. Today's terrible story has been recommended by many people, including some people who had very, very close connections with this person. I say it all the time, you guys, the world is so tiny and you just never know. You never know who your neighbors are. So we are headed to the heartland today, the sunflower state of Kansas. Repeating we're not in Kansas anymore. Oh, but we are in Kansas, girl. This is the story of Dennis Rader. So this is one of America's most notorious serial killers and most of the details in this story are mucho, mucho disturbing -oh. So fair warning, okay? You know that I'm gonna do my best to give you all of the information without giving you all of the information. You know what I'm saying? There are a lot of related photographs to this case that I will not be showing. So if you wanna see them, Google it. Also, if you wanna see what I'm using on my face today, just check down in the description box because everything is linked. In late 1973, the Otero family relocated to Wichita, Kansas. 38-year-old Joseph Otero had just retired from the military after 20 years of service. He served both in the Navy and in the Air Force. He and his wife, 33-year-old Julie, had five children. So the three older kids, Carmen, Charlie, and Danny, were in high school at the time, and the younger two, Josephine and Joseph Jr., were in elementary school. Now, life in the Otero family was great. With Joseph's military career, they lived all over the world. Julie was a doting stay-at-home mother, and she kept an immaculate house. On January 15th, 1974, Carmen, Charlie, and Danny Otero rushed off in the early morning snow to head off to school. They were all really good students, by the way. Now, lurking down the street was Dennis Rader. By 8.30 a.m., he had cut the phone lines to their house, and he was waiting for the perfect time to strike. Nine-year-old Joseph Jr. opened the back door to let out the family dog, Lucky, and when he did that, Dennis grabbed him and pushed his way into the house. He threatened them with a knife and a gun, saying that it was a robbery. He took the four Oteros, Joseph, Julie, Josephine, and Joseph Jr. to the back bedroom and tied them up. We're getting right into it, okay? So if you didn't click off and you're not, you don't want to hear it, click off. Starting with Joseph, he strangled each of them. He put shirts or some kind of cloth over their heads and then bags over their heads to smother them. He wasn't good at it. This was his first time ever strangling somebody. When one would pass out, he would move on to the next person 
and then they would wake up and then you'd have to like stop and like re smother them it's awful terrible but you know what maybe that's how he wanted it to go you know to stretch it out Ugh. anyways it was chaos so finally with joseph julie and joey jr dead he took 11 year old josie down to the basement he removed her clothing and hung her from a noose that was tied around a pipe hanging from the ceiling while she struggled he handled himself you know what i'm saying when he was done he tidied up the house, took the keys to the family car, and left right out of the front door. He took their car and dumped it at a nearby grocery store and then walked back to his car and went on with his day. Later that afternoon, the older kids, Carmen, Danny, and Charlie, arrived home from school. The garage door was open and the car was gone. The dog was outside, which was weird because, you know, it's an inside dog. Once inside, the house was silent, which was Weird. The second oldest son, Danny, ran down the hallway and opened up the bedroom door to find their parents dead. It didn't seem like their younger siblings had come home from school yet because they weren't around, so they ran out of the house to a neighbor's to call for help. When police arrived and searched the house, they found, of course, this brutal crime scene and all four of the deceased Otero family members. Dennis Rader later said that Josephine was his primary target because, quote, Hispanic people turn me on. Ick. Okay, so we've established the main idea. You know, he likes to watch. That's part of the, the kink, I guess. So this is a guy who has no human empathy. You know, he, he described these murders as projects. Well, after the Otero family, three months later, he selected the next victim on April 4th, 1974. 21-year-old Catherine Bright was a college student. Raider had his eye on her for some time. Um, apparently, they worked at the same place for a short time. While Catherine was away from home, Raider broke in through the back door and waited with a gun. To his surprise, when Catherine got home, she wasn't alone. She had her younger brother, Kevin, with her. So with the gun pointed at them, Raider announced that this was a robbery. It's kind of unclear to me who was tied up first, and even Raider doesn't remember who was tied up first, but anyways, the bonds came loose and a struggle ensued. This was chaos again. Raider ended up shooting Kevin in the head and he fell over, assumed to be dead. Catherine was fighting for her life, you know, and uh, Raider was struggling with her, trying to retie her and strangle her, and it just wasn't working. Kevin somehow woke up, you know, he was revived somehow, and he fought again with Raider until he was able to fire off another shot, and then sure that he was down for good that time. So then, back to Catherine, he ended up stabbing her in the back to subdue her. So now, with Catherine down for the count, Raider went back to check on Kevin, but he had escaped! He looked out the door and like saw him running down the street. Can you believe that? Okay, so with both of these incidents, he wasn't masked. He wasn't, he didn't conceal his identity at all. So they saw him sort of panicked. Raider cleaned up the house as best he could and he bounced out of there. He walked about a block to where his car was parked and got away. So Kevin Bright was able to help his sister, Catherine. He got help to come to the house and unfortunately she did die at the hospital, but he survived amazingly. The problem is with the injuries that were sustained in that struggle, he literally was unable to recall visual, you know, descriptions of the person. He just like couldn't remember. Well, that whole situation was like not how Dennis Rader wanted it to go, obviously. He was wildly out of control and that would not stand. So a few months later in October, somebody confessed to the media or police or whatever to killing the Otero family with a, an accomplice. Dennis Rader did not like that at all. You know, excuse me, how dare you take credit for my crimes, my projects, excuse me. And this is what started Dennis Rader communicating with the police and the media. So he wrote a detailed account of what happened that day at the Otero house, and then he stashed it inside of an engineering book at the public library. And then he called the newspaper to tell them where to find it. The note in part said, quote, those three dudes you have in custody are just talking to get publicity. The code words for me will be bind them, torture them, kill them, BTK. 
And then that's where the, the name comes from, BTK. He then closed that note with what became his um, trademark signature. A BTK with boobs for the B. Not kidding. Okay, well, after that, he retreated for a little while so he could think more about how to make his projects more successful. I mean, in, in his mind, anyway. On March 17th, 1977, three years after the last murder, Raider had planned his next project, but he actually went in another direction after the person that he was targeting didn't answer the door that day. Raider had been cruising the neighborhood you know, and he saw a young boy named Steven. Raider um, presented himself as a private detective and he asked the kid if he had seen these people and showed him a photograph of his own family, by the way. Well, the kid said, no, no, sir. And then he and Raider parted ways, but Dennis was watching. He watched which house he went into. So then he knocked on the door of the house and the kid let him inside. Remember, he's a policeman, to the kid anyway. Well, once inside the house, he pulled out a gun and 24-year-old um, Shirley, Stephen's mother, came out startled, like what's going on? Her husband was actually at work. She was home alone with the kids. So Raider locked the kids in the bathroom, three in all, Stephen and two other siblings. Then he attacked Shirley and strangled her to death. And then he gathered up all of his little items that he had brought with him in his, what he called his hit kit, which was a suitcase or a bowling bag for some of the other incidents with things inside, tools. The kids were actually able to provide a vague description of this intruder, this man, this attacker, but nothing came of it. Again, he was not masked at all. That December, Raider had chosen his next project, 25-year-old Nancy Jo Fox. As he had done with other houses, he cut the phone lines and broke in to her house through a back door and then waited. Now, unlike the attack with Catherine Bright, Raider's plan worked this time. Um, Nancy did come home alone. He attacked her, tied her up, strangled her to death, and um, also with all of these attacks, he would handle himself. You, you know what I'm saying? I mentioned that, right? So he didn't rape the victims in like the common definition, but he was leaving DNA all over the place. When he was finished, he tidied up as he often did. And then the next day he used a payphone to call and report the crime. You will find a homicide. 43 South Virginia, Nancy No kidding. Okay, so about a month later, Dennis Rader sent a card to the newspaper with a weird poem on it, and then he followed up with a letter to take credit for Nancy's murder. So up to this point, yes, the, the murders had been publicized, but they weren't being attributed to one person. Rader was getting pissed off. You know, why wasn't he getting the attention that he wanted? He sent another letter and this time he was very, very direct and threatening saying, how many people do I have to kill before I get some national attention? And then he gave recommendations for nicknames that they could call him. Wow, 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 wow. Listen, when you pick your own nickname, it's kind of lame, isn't it? Okay, so after that, a press conference was held in February 1978 by the police chief to announce the presence of a BTK strangler in the area. But he also said, quote, we have no reason to believe the individual has the capability to kill again. Why would you say that? Why would you say that? Okay, so a year later, Raider was back up to his old tricks. On April 28th, 1979, he broke into the home of 63-year-old Anna Williams and waited for her. She never showed up. So he got bored, I guess, and he took some of her personal items and left. About two months later, he returned these items to her via mail and included a poem inside. Can you, can you even... So on April 14th, 1979, the police decided to release the recording of that phone call to the public, the one from the payphone. They had hoped that somebody would recognize the voice, you know, and maybe get them closer to catching this person. Well, tips came pouring in from listeners, you know, but nothing of substance was discovered. By the way, Dennis Rader later told authorities that he loved hearing that phone call being played over and over and over on the news. 
course he did. But then he slinked away into the shadows for a few years, loving that publicity, but not taking any action. Meanwhile, police are still working this case actively. In 1984, they formed a task force to work exclusively on BTK. They called themselves the Ghostbusters. Love that. This task force painstakingly preserved every little shred of evidence, every crime scene, everything, every detail inside and out. Now remember, the start of these crimes happened well before, you know, a lot of the advances in forensic science have happened, like DNA evidence and all those things, but their efforts ended up paying off a lot way down the line. Many years passed after that. Um, until BTK struck again. Well, during this time, Raider's children were getting older, you know? He had become a Boy Scout leader. Uh, it was just occupied, I guess. But finally, on April 27th of 1985, the now 40-year-old Dennis Raider had to kill again. This is crazy. So he was in the middle of a Boy Scout meeting. <laughs> he said he had a headache and went out to his car to get something for it. But then he called a cab and went back to his neighborhood, one block over from his home, in fact. He cut the phone lines of his neighbor, 53-year-old Maureen Hedge. He broke into her house and waited in her closet. She had gone out for the night with her boyfriend, dinner and bingo. Her boyfriend brought her home they were in the house together for I don't know, about an hour or so before he left and then she got herself you know ready to go to bed once he was sure that she was alone he pounced attacked her strangled her to death and then with this one he took her body and put it in the trunk of his car drove her to his church took her body to the basement of the church and then did like a photo shoot with her. Then he put her body back in the car, drove her out, and dumped her body along a dirt road not really that far from their neighborhood. She was found about eight days later. On September 16th, 1986, Bill Weggerly returned home for lunch to find his two-year-old son sitting by himself, and his wife, 28-year-old Vicky, was dead in the bedroom. She had been strangled to death. A few hours earlier, Raider had done the old pose as a repairman trick and after he cut her phone lines then he knocked on the door to see if she was having any trouble with her phone i guess forced himself inside attacked her strangled her took pictures of her and then vanished sadly without any other credible evidence the husband became that primary suspect in vicky's death obviously he was later cleared but we're getting, we're getting there. What became Dennis Rader's last murder happened on January 19th, 1991. The gross grand finale, I guess. Dennis Rader was on another Boy Scout event. This one was a camping trip. He snuck away, drove to his church to change into his hit clothes, and then he walked to 62-year-old Dolores Davis's house. So he lurked outside of her house until he was sure that she was asleep inside. Then he threw a cinder block through the sliding glass door to break in, and then he attacked her, strangled her to death. Then he took her body and dumped it under a bridge. He then went back to church, changed back into his scouting clothes, and then went back to camping. Now, you guys, as I said, this, this person is one of America's worst serial killers, and his crimes are so heinous. You know, he's BTK, bind, torture, kill. He tortured these people. So I have not belabored that point, but I just don't want that to be lost. Now, the next 13 years were very quiet and police had nothing that would make any headway. Just a total mystery, cold case. So cut to 2004, the Wichita Eagle, which is the local newspaper, ran a 30th anniversary piece on BTK 30 years after the murders of the Otero family. Now, this is not blaming the paper at all. Media is very important. But Raider did later say that that article is what got him going again. Now, we can all agree that what really happened is that he was just so proud and controlling of his projects that he wanted credit, okay? He wanted to be the one to tell his story. Here's really where it starts to heat up. 
In mid-March of 2004, the Wichita Eagle received a package from a Bill Thomas Kilman, BTK, containing a photograph of Vicki Weggerly's driver's license and photocopies of three Polaroids of Vicki at the crime scene labeled BTK, the boob signature. They were definitely not police crime scene photos. And until this package, Vicky's death had not been linked to BTK. Now this is what kicked off like a months long, wild back and forth between Dennis Rader and the police through the media. In letters, he would compare himself to Jack the Ripper and other infamous serial killers. He was sending puzzles and notes and leaving like little creepy clues to tease them, like Nancy Fox's driver's license. And um, there was a Barbie doll with like a hood over its head and its arms tied behind its back. That was found in a public park. You know, he was really into it and loving every minute of it. So one of the postcards that was sent mentioned a package at a Home Depot. And when police looked into the security footage at the Home Depot, they noticed that there was a Jeep Cherokee driving repeatedly through the parking lot, looking very suspicious. Sus, as the kids say. That's suspicious. You can just file away that little nugget for later. Okay, so the police were all over this, you know, and they were working non-stop trying to untangle the puzzles and like pull as much evidence as they possibly could from what was pouring in. They would use the classified ads in the newspaper to communicate with BTK. One of the final teases from Raider ended up being his downfall a floppy disk. Now you guys, you guys remember floppy disks, right? Well, this was like the mid 2000s. So this is like end stage floppy disks where they weren't really floppy. It was like, you know, in a, like a plastic case, but you remember like legit floppy disks, right? Like playing Oregon Trail in computer class in like the early nineties. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Anyways. Okay. So in January, 2005, police were given a floppy disk, a disk, computer disk, that had been sent to the local Fox News affiliate by Dennis Rader, we know now. So an examination of the metadata on the disk revealed that it had been prepared by a user named Dennis at a um, Christ Lutheran church. All right, so the police check into it, of course, you know, they check out what is this Christ Lutheran church? Is there anybody there named Dennis? Oh wait, there is. It's the president of the congregation. Well, when investigators found, you know, the information for a Dennis Rader in an address, they scoped out his house. And what was parked in the driveway, you ask? A Jeep Cherokee, just like the one that they saw in the Home Depot security footage. Okay, so that's really exciting, but not so fast. Anybody could have used that disc, the computer disc, that was maybe already formatted. You know, when they found it, maybe they picked it out of the trash. The police couldn't just like bust up in his house. You know, police really needed a way to be able to confirm or eliminate Dennis Rader as BTK. So remember the Ghostbusters, right? So remember the Ghostbusters task force? Well, they had all of this evidence on hand. Now it's 2005, DNA evidence, profiling, all of that stuff is definitely a thing. But a lot of these crimes happened way, way earlier. Well, like I mentioned, the Ghostbusters, they had more evidence than they knew they had at the time. So there was things collected from like the 1970s and 80s crime scenes. The universe just said, hey, you should collect this and keep it. We don't know what it is or what purpose it might serve, but it came in handy later because it was DNA evidence. So now that police have a name, right? They're scoping him out. They're figuring out who is this man? Does he have family? Who are his known associates? Like what's going on? Does he have a record? Any of that stuff. So they found out that Dennis Rader's daughter had a medical appointment. So they were able to get a warrant for her DNA. They just wanted to quietly see if they could do a familial match. Of course, her the daughter is not the one who committed the crime, but her DNA is gonna match the profile, perhaps, of some of the DNA that was collected at these crime scenes. It matched. On February 25th, 2005, Dennis Rader was driving home from the office to have lunch with his wife when the police 
closed in. They swarmed him, got him out of his Jeep, and took him into custody. Once he was presented with the DNA evidence, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, confessed. He confessed everything in such detail, horrifying detail. He was clearly very proud of it. I am BTK. Yeah. And I'm the guy they're after, 100%. So who is Dennis Rader? Glad you asked. Dennis Lynn Rader was born on March 9th, 1945 in Pittsburgh, Kansas to Dorothy and William Rader. He grew up just outside of Wichita and he had three younger brothers. Now, both of his parents worked full time, which um, that's unusual, right? For the mom to work full time. Anyway, at that, in, in that day, anyways. Anyway, okay, there was no abuse in the house. It was a perfectly normal upbringing. I mean, in fact, maybe they didn't give him enough attention. I did read in my research that as a child, noticed that he became aroused whenever he received a spanking. But for sure, Dennis was showing some red flags at an early age, meaning he would like torture and hang animals and kill animals for fun. It's not good. Well, that behavior progressed into violent sexual fantasies and he was really into scenarios with like trapped or helpless women victims. He enjoyed voyeurism, autoerotic asphyxiation, and cross-dressing. So he would creep on his female neighbors, he would steal their clothes, he would wear their clothes while he handled himself. He would tie ropes or bindings around his arms and neck. There are pictures of this. I will not be showing them. I've said this many times. There is nothing wrong with bedroom creativity, but what Dennis Rader was doing was like out of bounds. You know, he was able to keep his private interests private for the most part. He served in the United States Air Force for four years. And then he, after that, went back to school, got a college degree, got married in 1971, had two kids. It was all very normal. He was absolutely living a double life. You know, certainly normal at home, Cub Scout leader, all of that, but he was carrying on murdering these people in his spare time. By around 1973, he was growing more and more dissatisfied at work and he started thinking about what it would be like to kill someone. So as I said, he was the president of his church council congregation and around 1990, he became a compliance officer for the suburb. They lived like right outside of Wichita on like the north side. We know now about some incidents with his compliance officer duties that he took very seriously. He, like, the power was very important to him. He, he was literally the guy with a ruler measuring the grass to see if it was too long. He was described by many as arrogant and rude and confrontational and a control freak, but he was also described as a friendly, regular, nice guy. So after that murder in 1991, he had gone back to normal life, as it were. So he would later say that what he enjoyed the most about his projects was the anticipation before and then the memories of it afterward. Sometimes he would wear masks. He definitely kept trophies. He would collect items from the crime scenes. He kept a treasure trove, like a locked trunk, but he was very, very careful to keep those things hidden away from his family. So Dennis Rader was meticulous and very calculating. He was a certified mega monster, but he wasn't stupid. He wanted control, he wanted absolute dominance and deference. It wasn't enough for him to commit the crimes, you know, he, he needed people to recognize his power. The male ego, man, gets you every time. So after his arrest, Raider said that he enjoyed seeing all of the fuss about BTK all over the news. Yeah, we get it. Well, Raider's family and friends were stunned. His wife, Paula, requested an emergency divorce, like shortly after his arrest, which I didn't know that an emergency divorce was a thing. Good to know. Psychology experts describe Dennis Rader as a narcissistic psychopath with severe antisocial personality disorder. He has no regret or guilt or n any negative feelings at all surrounding his crimes. On June 27th of 2005, Dennis Rader was in court 
for the murders of all 10 known victims. He straight up pled guilty to all of them. He discussed, in fact, for two days in gruesome detail, in a very matter-of-fact way, the motivation, the planning, and the execution of all of the crimes. He talked about it like it was nothing. On August 18th, 2005, he was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms. He is currently serving his sentence at the El Dorado Correctional Facility in El Dorado, Kansas. And that is the story of Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. So there is endless information about this case, books, journals, everything you could ever want. Also check out Mind Hunter. It's a TV series. Um, it's not a docu-series at all. It's definitely a dramatization, but it is based on true events and they pull things from this case in a very, very creepy way. Thanks again to Case Defy for sponsoring today's video. Make sure that you check the description box and also the pinned comment for the link to go shopping and for a coupon code to save 15% on your order. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me everywhere there's social things happening. <laughs> That's it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! <clears throat> Raiders. <clears throat> Teenth, 19... What am I doing with this makeup? I don't know. Fuck, that is loud and juicy. A notification? Nope. <laughs> Get it together. Get it together. A match.